Today I want to tell you the story of the day that Samantha completely upended our recovery process. Now at the time, I wouldn't, nor would have Samantha even used the word recovery. Uh, we were just a couple of weeks in. We had decided that we needed to leave our home in California, and we had decided to move to Texas where we live now. And I was outside cleaning the garage, and I wouldn't have used the word recovery. I wouldn't have used the word recovery process. I would have just said, okay, this is how it's going to go. And Samantha walked outside, and like any unfaithful spouse who was just a week or two in, I wondered why was she coming outside because, to use a biblical term, she had a face like flint. She was determined. There was no emotion, but I could tell something was coming my way, and she walked outside and said, when we get to Austin, I want to separate, and I think that we need this, and I need this, and this is what we're going to do. And she walked inside. And I think that was probably one of the most significant panic attacks that I had had besides the initial discovery and the initial conversation or two with her um, upon discovery. What went through my mind was sheer and utter panic because this moment shook me because it was kind of like a wake-up call to say, hey, I know that you think recovery is going to look like this, but it's really not. In my mind, like many unfaithful spouses, I had this thought, well, it's going to be difficult. It's, I don't know what to expect, but you know, hopefully in a few days she'll get over it. Yeah, that's lunacy. Eventually her anger will calm down and, and we'll just kind of move forward. I didn't know anything else besides that. We had seen this therapist who was a bit of a whack job. I'm just going to be honest with you. He had no clue what he was doing and actually made things worse. Uh, we had told just a few people our lives were falling apart, and now she's telling me that she wants to separate. And it shook me because I still thought I was in some form of a control of how things were going to go. I felt like, well, this is what's going to happen, and we'll just move on down the road. You see, at this moment, I can look back now and realize this was Samantha standing up for herself. This was Samantha deciding that she was going to put some boundaries around her life. And I was faced with the reality that, wait a minute, you mean I'm not in charge? You mean I don't get to dictate how recovery is going to go? You mean I am actually being told by you, my victim, how things are going to go? To say it upended me is a gross understatement. Looking back, I'm incredibly proud of Samantha because that moment was one of probably thousands of defining moments where she decided, hold on, I'm not a slave. I'm not a slave to what you want to do. I'm not going to just kind of sit back and let things just be how they need to be. I'm going to stand up for myself and protect me, protect the kids, and no longer be a prisoner to your dysfunction and your controlling tendencies. Now, it's important that you understand, we did separate, it was only a couple of weeks. Uh, it hurt like hell, but it, it wasn't you know, a six month or, or what have you separation, but it did some things that really I thought would be applicable to maybe some of your journeys that are out there. Number one is it was a defining moment that empowered Samantha that she realized she had options. Like, yes, she was a stay-at-home mom, and yes, we had lost my salary, we had lost uh, an, an enormous amount of investors in the ministry. I mean, we were running on fumes, but she still had the guts and the courage to say, hey, I'm not a prisoner to you, and I'm not going to just sit back because I have options. And 
it was a moment for her to really stand up for herself. And I think every betrayed spouse in a situation like this has a moment or maybe thousands of moments where you have to stand up for yourself and for your own healing and realize, wait a minute, I have options here. Number two is it woke me up from a slumber of, or better said, deception to think that, you know what, it's all going to be okay. I'm not going to have to do much work. I'm not going to really have to, you know, this isn't going to cost me very much. Maybe my salary and yes, the ministry, because I still hadn't absorbed the enormity of what was going on in our life. And so it really helped sober me up even more to the realization of, hey, this isn't autopilot. Like, this isn't just going to blow over. This is real life trauma. The third thing that this separation discussion did was it established a boundary. It was Samantha saying, I'm going to put boundaries around me and the kids because I'm not just running blindly into restoration. I'm going to decide later what I'll do after we get help, after we get the best help that we can find. I'll decide later, but right now there's boundaries. And so if you think, Samuel, that we're just riding off into the sunset and that you can just assume that I'm staying here and putting up with everything that's going to go on, you probably need a little bit of a wake-up call. Here's your wake-up call, this little separation. Finally, the separation caused me to really go to the next gear of getting help. Like I was like, oh, oh, okay, hold on. I remember sitting in our home office crying to her to not take the kids away from me. Now, I know I I wish that I had said, please don't leave me, please don't be apart from me, but I, true story, I was more broken and and dealing with a gut-wrenching sense of pain because I was going to be away from the kids, not because I was going to be away from Samantha. I know that may be hard to hear, but it's the truth. I was more devastated that I wasn't going to see the kids every day and tuck them in than I was that I wasn't going to see Samantha every day. That's how unhealthy I was. That's how in the fog I was. That's how completely just dysfunctional I was. And so let me land the plane, if you will, with this. So we separated for a couple of weeks. It hurt like hell. But Samantha and I finally found some some help that were just brilliant. They were a gift to us. I, I love them dearly. We found them, and they helped us understand, look, if you are wanting to give it a shot, for your specific situation, the separation needs to come to a close. And then we found Rick literally two weeks later, and Rick echoed the same sentiments. I don't know if that's the same situation for you. But for us, we ended the separation, came together. I had a whole new sense of desperation to get healthy. I knew that Samantha wasn't going to sit back and just let me do whatever I want, be as lazy as I want, be as disengaged as I want, as, and be as disconnected as I want. Like, I was faithful to set up meetings with Rick. I was faithful to do my homework and exercises I was supposed to be doing. I was faithful to do all the things that Samantha said to me that I was going to have to do if we were going to remain in the same house. So for you, I don't know what separation means. I don't know if you should, I don't know if you shouldn't, but I hope today has given you some indications of when you may need to separate or what boundaries will do for the dysfunction of the unfaithful spouse when they just assume we'll just ride off into the sunset together. This won't cost me very much. My final thought or I guess caveat for you is before you separate, make sure you get some expert insight on it. Make sure that it's not just a a knee-jerk reaction. But if you separate and your unfaithful spouse doesn't care, is fine with it, it doesn't wake them up, hopefully it wakes them up eventually. Hopefully it gets their attention eventually. But if it doesn't cause any change, if it doesn't create any urgency on their behalf, it is a red flag. It is a significant concern. And it should in many ways encourage you that separation may in fact be what you need to do early on or even further down the road if there's an unwillingness to change, an unwillingness to break things off with the affair partner, an unwillingness to get help, 
an unwillingness to respect your boundaries, certainly if there's any threat of domestic violence, then those indicating factors might mean separation is the next step.